It's interesting, isn't it, that we can sing a song like that and think about how amazing that love is toward us and yet fail to show that same love toward others whom that love has been shown to from Christ. We had an exceedingly great time last week with the elders being down here and with guests coming to show our support as we did our first installation and our first right hand of fellowship. And one of the things that was on my heart that even the elders had charged me with, and maybe you have heard it too, is now be careful to preserve the unity. The Lord is working here. It's obvious. We were down to three families before I had come. And we saw how many people were here and other people that are still regularly attending and coming and serving. These things don't happen by accident. The Lord is at work here. And when the Lord is at work, who comes to try and usurp? And what happens when that attack comes from the outside? We tend to rally together, don't we? We rally together to fight. But what happens when that attack comes subtly from the inside? When there's dainty morsels of whisperings going around, shredding other people's characters, judging the thoughts and intentions of their heart, not seeking to show that same amazing love that we sang about, where we're so thankful that that love has been poured out upon us. And when it's our turn to allow that love to flow through us, we close those floodgates. We dam it up so that only we could have that love. It's an amazing thing to think if Christ would pour out love on somebody, that we would place ourselves in a position where we would not pour out love on them. And all the while saying, and I love Christ. No. There's a disconnect somewhere there. There's a disconnect. And we must be diligent, even amidst all the excitement, to preserve the unity and the bond of peace. Because that will be our downfall. If we lose unity in Christ and unity with one another, all of us will be injured. And this church will be like so many other churches. It will turn into a, some kind of coffee shop, some kind of, hey, that was a great idea. Well, it lasted. But it's gone. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. And as you're turning there, I'd like to pray for the Lord's enablement in me and also that our hearts would be soft to receive this message. Father, Grant us grace. Grant me grace that I might preach Your truth. That I might preach Christ. That all of us, Lord, would be changed to be more like Christ. That all of us would recognize that, that we have a responsibility before You with how we conduct ourselves. And that we're not ultimately responsible for the people that aren't here, the people that are sitting next to us or behind us or in front of us, but for ourselves. And that each one of us needs your word because each one of us is weak and prone to falling. Soften our hearts that your spirit would work within us, that your word would take root and anchor us to Christ, that we might be one. It's in His name we pray. Amen.
You'll notice at the outset of this letter, Paul and Timothy, bondservants, slaves of Christ Jesus, to all the saints. To all the saints. Isn't that sufficient? Why does he have to say, including the overseers and the deacons? Why does he have to list the two offices in the church also? He's setting the stage for something. Unity. Unity. One of the words that Paul usually uses right up front is what? Paul, called as an apostle. It's absent here, isn't it? Instead, he says slaves of Christ. Do you know what other letter Paul also says slaves of Christ? In his introduction? Romans. That might not mean much right now, but it's interesting that in the letter to the Romans and the letter to the Philippians, he starts out and says, slaves. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 and verse 12. I'll start in 11 as you're turning. So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. A Roman colony, Philippi, founded by Alexander the Great's dad, Philip II. A Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. Now I know... Part of this might be some review for some of us that have talked during the week. But bear with me. And it's it's no wonder that so often in Scripture we're called to remember. To remember. Uh, Paul says that all throughout Romans. He says that in Ephesians. Peter says, I'm here to stir you up by way of reminder. Philippi, a leading city. Roman colony. Scroll down a little bit to verse 21. You know what happens here. Paul goes, there's no synagogue, which means what? There's not enough Jewish men in that area to form a synagogue. And so what does he do then? He finds out there's a place of prayer outside the city where some women are gathering. So he goes out and goes to minister to the women outside the city. And we have our first convert, Lydia, because the Lord opened her heart. And then they're continuing to minister there in Philippi. And there's this girl that's demon-possessed. And they cast the demon out of her, and her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, so they got upset. And so the charge they leveled against them, in verse 21, they are proclaiming customs which is not lawful for us to accept or to observe being Romans. There they are in Philippi. Philippi was a special city. You had a special status. Paul was able to say, I'm a, is, it, is it fair, is it legal for you to beat me without a trial and hide me away being a Roman? And they got scared. But Paul didn't even have this level of citizenship. This is where the veterans went. Philippi. It was a special piece of land that had the same benefits as if you were living in Rome, which meant there was taxes you didn't have to pay. There was land you could own. You had the most freedom in the Roman Empire if you lived in Rome or if you lived in Philippi. Which is why I said it's interesting that Paul says that he's a slave in which two letters? Romans? And Philippians. Why? Aren't you going to say, take some pride and, well, I'm from Rome. Where are you from? Oh, Ephesus? Yeah, I'm from Rome. I'm from Philippi. Yeah, yeah, we don't pay that tax. No, no, I don't rent. I own my land. And so what ends up happening? We can take 
pride in the possessions and in the earthly benefits and tether ourselves to the land, tether ourselves to this temporary earth. And Paul knew this, which is why he strategically organized even his introduction to these letters, specifically here in Philippians. And when you think of Philippians, what's that word that you normally think of? Joy, rejoice. Do you take those both words together? It's used about 16 times in the book. But where does that joy come from? Unity. Unity in Christ and unity with one another because of Christ. Unity in Christ and unity in Christ's people. Look at even chapter 4, verse 2 of Philippians. I'll read verse 1 and 2. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Eodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. How would you like to have your name in Scripture for not having unity? Paul calls them out. This letter is to be read in front of the church and the surrounding churches that these two ladies are not unified. And we'll notice this live in harmony, this have the same mind, we're going to see that in our section of Scripture. And stand firm in the Lord, we're going to see that. It's woven all throughout this beautiful letter. So what I would like for us to do If you'll open up in your bulletin, you'll see an outline in there. That is the outline that we're going to follow as we look at Philippians 1, 27 and following. Philippians 1, 27 and following. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. This word only is emphatic. It's thrown all the way up at the front. In Greek, word order is used for emphasis. The position of the words is dictated by case endings. And what he's saying is, only this. First. And we also, coincidentally, have our first imperative, our first command in this letter. And it's, it's kind of misworded here, conduct yourselves. It actually comes from a word related to the word city. It's live as citizens of. If you look at the front of your bulletin, it's translated correctly on the front there. Live as citizens worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now this might not mean much to many people, But this would mean a lot to the Philippians. Why? Because they took pride in their citizenship. We just read that guy in Acts 16. They're doing things that's not good for us, being Romans. See, in Rome and in Philippi, you could have any religion you wanted as long as you submitted that to Caesar. And Philippi had all kinds of religions. And all through their history, they would just absorb the religions of the people when they were taken over. Up until Rome, absorb, absorb. One caveat. All of those things need to line up under Caesar, under the emperor. And Christianity didn't do that. There is one Lord. We will not bow to Caesar. 
And so Paul's coming and saying, hey, that's great that you are citizens of Philippi and that you don't have to pay these taxes and that you can own land and things like that. But that's not where your citizenship is. In fact, he commands them. This is the mandate. Live as citizens worthy of the gospel. And I think this speaks a lot to us too, doesn't it? We're in America. One of the wealthiest nations on the planet right now. We have so many benefits. We have so many freedoms. We have so many privileges. Because we are Americans. And when you go places, people are proud to be American. There's songs, proud to be an American. And what do we sometimes do? We sometimes also get proud that we're Americans, right? We take pride in that. But it's not anything that we've done. And it's not our primary allegiance. I have, and you have, more in common with an Iraqi Christian than an unbelieving American. Because we are one in Christ. There should be more unity with someone who is in Christ from a different country than someone who's not in Christ in this country. Paul reiterates this in chapter 3, verse 20. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's speaking to them and he's addressing this. And we, we think about this. We do this in playful terms. Think about sports. You, we had the, that soccer game with the Timberlands and was it Seattle Sounders? Uh, just the other day and people were all coming out and all their, all their you know, green and all their, their light green and blue. And everybody's excited and we have different football teams that we root for. And we go, oh no, I'm, I'm with the Niners. Oh, I'm with the Seahawks. Oh, I'm with this team. And we have these kinds of battles, but we take pride in our team. The Philippians took pride in their citizenship, in their team. Yeah, we're not in Rome, but we have all the benefits of Rome. Paul says, stop it. You are a citizen of the gospel. You cannot mix this light and this darkness together. You cannot have these two opposing pulls on your heart. Your allegiance is to Christ. Yes, you submit to your government and be thankful that you have these freedoms, but that's not where your heart is. That's not where your allegiance is. It must be with Christ. It must be with the gospel. So much so that he says, live as citizens in a manner worthy. It's suitable for something. Something is worthy if it's suitable for something. When, when it's properly represented. You may, you may represent a company. You surely represent your family. And if you go and do something unbecoming of the values of your family or your company and someone else sees you, what happens? Shame. Shame. And they'll say, you, you're not exhibiting your life in a manner worthy of this company or of this family. What's going on? And Paul is calling the Philippians and also us to live as citizens, citizens, in a manner worthy of the gospel. Is your Christian life being lived worthy of the gospel? Is your Christian life worthy of imitation? I'm not saying, are you perfect? But would you be able to say, I'm not perfect. I love Christ. Follow me. 
the things which you see in me and hear in me, follow after them. Because I follow Christ and I love Christ. And if you follow after me, you will grow in Christ. Because although not perfect, I live as a citizen worthy of the gospel. My life, my conduct is in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. So when people see me, they say, there's something off with that person. But I want to get to know more about it. And for Christians, they say, I want to line myself up under that person. I want to know what he knows. I want to handle a situation the way I saw him handle that situation. I want to use wisdom like he's used wisdom or she's used wisdom. Friends, am I talking about you when I say these things? Are you sitting there saying, yes, this is, this is, I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I got a lot, a lot to grow, a long way to go. But I, I am doing this by God's grace. And I'm, I long to pull others behind me to disciple them for Christ. And he says, worthy, men are worthy of what? The gospel of Christ. What is the gospel? It's interesting that so often we have conversations, even with one another. And the bulk of the conversation excludes the gospel. Even when we're telling somebody about how we talk to someone about the gospel, we'll say, yeah, it was great. We did this, this, and this, and this, and then gave them the gospel. And sometimes, I, I, I've learned, I sometimes have to stop and ask, when you say you gave them the gospel... What do you mean? And you get a variety of answers. I gave them my testimony. Your testimony is not the gospel. Your testimony is a beautiful reality of what the gospel provided and afforded to you, but it is not the gospel. We're not trying to make clones of Joey or clones of you. We're trying to get people to follow Christ. So we must point them to Christ. There may be some personal application and ways of, of bridging the gap that we use our testimony in with them, but we must preach Christ. This Christ, you think about it. All of us have failed. When we go out and we talk with people, have you ever told a lie? You told more than one? What does that make you? You know how many people will say, human human. Would you say at least 50%? At least 50% of the people say, I'm human. Nobody's perfect. That's not true entirely, is it? Because there was one that was perfect. Christ. And friend, that's why we're out here today. Because there was one that was perfect. And although God has made himself evident to all of us, and we know that there is a God, more than that, we know that there is the true God. We don't worship Him as we ought to. We don't love Him as we should. And we don't come to Him because every time we get close, our conscience gets reactivated. And we feel condemned. Our conscience condemns us. And think about even as a Christian in your personal life, what happens? You're going through your life and you fall into some sin. And then you feel guilty. And you know what you should do. Confess it, repent, come back to the Lord. But instead, what do you do? You dig your heels in. I'm not worthy to pick up my Bible. I'm not worthy to pray. And then what happens? It goes and it goes and it spirals and it spirals and it spirals. And your conscience keeps condemning you. But what are you supposed to do? You come back to Christ. You come dirty. You don't clean yourself off, even as a Christian. Christ hasn't changed. You don't clean yourself off before you come to Him. He says, come to me. If you're, if you're faithful to confess, 
to turn from your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we have this life that is so short. That is so short. It's amazing. When, when you talk with older people, and they'll say, I can remember almost like it was yesterday. And they'll tell you this story about like a horse and buggy and things like that. And even for us, looking back, looking at our kids, looking at our friends, looking at people younger than us, we're just kind of like, what happened to all the time? It's gone. It's fleeting. But today, we have. Right now, we have, and we know we have for sure. And we are to live in a manner worthy of this gospel. That we have sinned. That we have fallen short. We have missed the mark. But there is one who did not miss that mark. The worthiest one. Christ Himself. He lived that perfect life. I find it astounding to think the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Seems simple enough, doesn't it? Maybe to memorize, but not to do, because we're so inherently selfish. Even oftentimes when we serve somebody else. But to always be loving God and to always be loving your neighbor and putting them before you, Christ did that. Christ, very God of very God, put others before him, sinful people. He grew up with sinful parents and still submitted to them, himself having no sin. It is astounding to me to think of that he would live out that perfect life and that he would pay the debt on the cross. You think of Moses. And Deuteronomy with Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal when he's got the people split. Here, here, all the people on Gerizim, he's calling out all the blessings. All the people on Mount Ebal, he's calling out all the curses. And Christ fulfilled everything according to the law perfectly, even in his thought life, and received the curses. Why? We just sang about it. Amazing love. Because of the love that he has. We've seen the mandate. The mandate here is that we must, it says, conduct yourselves, live as citizens of the gospel in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. You'll notice also the manner. The manner. He continues on. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. It's interesting, whether I come and see you or remain absent. Whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you. And we were talking about that. What are the things that you hear of? When you do what you're supposed to do at work, do people hear about it? People come and go, oh, that's a great filing job you did there. Hey, I'm really glad that you know. You, you, you made the deadline on all these things. Hey, I'm really glad you made it into work on time. Good job. Hey, and you stayed all day? Proud of you. Well, you didn't take a long break. Look at you go. You're amazing. Are those the things that we hear about? No. When people go above and beyond, it's like, hey, you know, Joe created and streamlined this new process. It's going to make things much more efficient. It's going to be a lot easier on everybody. When you go above and beyond, when something like that happens, that's when you hear about these things. Or when something goes wrong. But the context that Paul's talking about here is when something's going so right above and beyond. That's when you hear about something. And he's saying, whether I'm there or whether I'm not, I will hear of you. And what is he going to hear of you going above and beyond he says that you are standing firm in one spirit. This is present. This is active. This is continuous. This is 
commitment, a continuous commitment, standing firm. This word has the idea of holding one's ground, maintaining a position in battle, firmly committed no matter the cost. Death, pain, loss of limb, loss of family member, loss of life, loss of property, standing firm. It's used of a soldier who's resolved to defend his position even unto death. And this word striving together, also continual. But this is, this is more of the action side of it. So you've got the mindset going on inside and you've got the action, this commitment and this action. And the picture here is struggling side by side. It's used in, in teamwork in sports. People struggling side by side, also soldiers in a battle. You think of the, the phalanx. The people are moving together as one person. In 480 B.C., you may know this, this story, Persia was coming to invade Greece, and there was a, a man by the name of Leonidas who was a Spartan. And he and 300 other Spartans, along with roughly 6,000 other Greeks, stood firm at Thermopylae, the hot gates. It's this area of land where everything kind of funnels in, where they knew, all right, all this whole host of Persia is going to have to funnel in. So we're going to be able to hold them off and we can protect our country. And you know what happened. They were there. They were fighting. They were holding their ground day after day. United. Standing firm. Striving together arm in arm. Unified. One goal. Until what? One Greek went from within and went to Xerxes, the emperor of Persia, and said, I can show you a pathway to get around and behind these guys. And they all died because one person showed them a back route. When we don't repent and confess the seeds of disunity and turn back to loving Christ, you become that back root that Satan uses to bring about disunity within Christ's body. Think about that. And it doesn't start by, I'm going to wake up one day and I'm going to go cause disunity in my church. It starts out with bitterness in the heart. It starts out with not striving together, struggling together, arm in arm, to love one another and preserve the bond of unity. Think about all the pastors and all, all the people that commit moral failure and fall. We had one not too long ago, maybe a year ago now, in Portland. Do you think when he started his ministry, or do you think when he married his wife, he said, you know what? I want to give this marriage 15, 20 good years, and then I want to ruin it. And then I'm going to go into the ministry, and I'm going to get a ministry going, and I'm going to be teaching at these seminaries, and then I'm going to commit moral failure and disqualify myself. Do you think he woke up and just said that at the outset of his ministry, the outset of his marriage? No. I'm sure it was the farthest thing from his mind. I'm sure when he stood up, on that altar with his wife in front of those people and said, I commit to forsake all others to have you. He meant it. But nevertheless, he fell. It's a very slow fade. And if we are harboring unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, or even not pursuing one another in love as we are able to from the joy in the depths of our heart because we see Christ in that person and we want to present every person complete in Christ, not just in this church, but all Christians, all people. If that's not the cry of our heart, we will cause others to stumble. We will cause others to stumble. So I want to ask you, are you resolved 
to stand firm for Christ in the unity of his body? Are you resolved to do that? What safeguards and what steps have you put in place knowing that we're all sinners, we're all sinful, we're selfish, to be able to guard against and promote loving others and lifting them up? What contingency plans have you already set in place? Well, just in case I don't fulfill this, I can go do that. Do you come to situations saying, I'm willing to give it my all if these things are met and just in case it doesn't, here's my escape route. You're not striving together. Think about those 300 on the beach. They were firmly committed unto death. And what about us? We learned last week with Pastor Hargrove. He said, the time is near. Leave it all in the field. To live is Christ. To die is gain. What's the worst that can happen if we're pursuing Christ and we're spent and we get expired and we die? Is that so bad? Do you hate Christ so much that you don't long to be with him? That death and seeing your Savior face to face is a kind of punishment for you? Or is it because you don't want to admit it that there's so many cords of your heart that are so tied and so tethered to this world and your relationships and citizenships here that these are the things you pour into and feed? And so it's not so much that you hate Christ explicitly, but you don't love Him in the same way you love the things that are on the earth. Are you willing not just to support this unity with empty lip service, but to labor for it unto death? Christ died for His body. Can we do any less? Can we say, well, I support you in that wholeheartedly. That's not my area of giftedness. I don't really have that. I can't, I can't do that but I'm going to support you from back here. That's not what Paul's saying. He's saying striving together, arm in arm, struggling together. You can't struggle together arm in arm with somebody when you're sitting on the sideline. You're not with them. You're not unified. You're separate. We've seen the mandate, the manner in which we are to pursue this mandate. And the measurement now. The measurement. Look at verse 28 with me. In no way, alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you and that too from God. For to you it has been granted, for Christ's sake, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. This word for alarmed in verse 28 is frightened. It's a word used about horses when they get spooked. Anybody seen a horse get spooked? What happens when a horse gets spooked? People get hurt, huh? They know they, they forget everything, right? They forget everything. And now you've got this huge beast that's uncontrolled, freaking out, Stepping on people, knocking into people, or jolting off. That's what this word is. And oftentimes, horses will get spooked over nothing, right? Sometimes it's just nothing, or it's a weird noise or something, but there's no actual threat to their life when they get spooked. So he's saying, in no way alarmed by your opponents. Don't be frightened. It's interesting because he's using this military word about a horse in what kind of context? In Philippi, which was a city made up of a bunch of veterans that had fought in wars that were given the special Roman citizenship. So they're going to know the dangers that disunity can cause because they've seen it on the battlefield when somebody's horse gets spooked and jolts off and breaks the line and takes off and that guy gets thrown off the horse. 
just a vivid image. Paul's saying, in no way alarmed by your opponents. And I think this is, this is a great opportunity for us to measure ourselves and to measure the validity of our profession, the validity of our commitment to unity. Are we willing, even when something seems to be threatening our, our life, to say, I will hold this line for Christ and for his people? How can I not? He has given so much to me. In what ways do you allow fear to control you? In what ways do you allow fear to control you? What are the things you're afraid of? What people might say? If you commit to this one thing, the time you're going to have to rearrange, what is it? Oftentimes, it's over nothing. But when we're controlled by fear, even in part, how do you think you're going to be able to strive together with one mind? If you've got a hundred people dead set, we will die for this unity. We will die for this Savior. Where's, where's the sting of death? It's gone because he's taken it. And so now we are here to serve him as lights into the world. But you've got one person that's not committed. They'd like to be. Like they're there with you, but they're, they're not really there in their heart and they're frightened about it. And they get spooked. What happens to that line? It breaks. It breaks. Just like the destruction of those 6,000 plus Greeks on Thermopylae. How many people did it take to wipe them out? It took one person from the inside to become a traitor. And he says here, this is a sign. Which is a sign, verse 28. It's kind of like a double-edged sword. I see it like that. Our unity will cut to the heart of the opponent. It will cut them to the heart, saying, we can't be moved. Our allegiance goes much deeper than this temporal life. We hold on to something worth dying for. We hold on to something worth living for. At the same time, our unity will prune us and be a measurement of our salvation. We're not going to be alarmed by our opponents. And that's going to be a sign of salvation. It's not going to be the root of salvation, but it'll be evidence of it. And then he goes into this. For to you, in verse 29, it has been granted. That's that word for gracious gift. It's a gracious gift. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him. Isn't that weird? So we have only conduct yourselves. First thing. And then in 29, not only, not, not first thing. It's there. But what do we tend to put? Right up front, faith. I'm saved. What does Paul say? Not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. Does your heart sing when you hear that? Lord, thank you. Thank you that you're granting me to suffer for your name's sake. You read through church history. And that was the cry of the reformers. That was the cry of Christians all through the ages. Some to the point where they were being burned to the stake and said, you don't even need to tie me up. I won't leave. What a blessing it is to die for my Savior. And they would sing hymns as they were lit on fire. And the smell of their flesh went for miles. Singing hymns, what a great joy it is to suffer for Christ. And we read through this and go, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Uh, let's look at chapter 2. But that's not what this says, is it? Let's look at Hebrews 
just really quick, keep your finger there in Philippians. We're coming back. Hebrews 5.8. Although He was a Son, who's He? Christ. He learned obedience from the things which He suffered. He learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And if we hold dear that verse, Romans 8, 28, and we know that God works all things together for good for those who love him and have been called according to his purpose, then we also hold dear that verse, Romans 8, 29, which says what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. To his likeness. And how does that happen? Through suffering. We learn obedience through suffering. And on the face of it, we don't like it. But when we come out the other end, we wouldn't have had it any other way, would we? We wouldn't have had it any other way because we've known how much He's grown us through that time. Look at also Hebrews 2.18. For since he himself, Christ, actually we could even back up, verse 17, therefore he had, that word literally means was obligated. And I just think, what we're saying about amazing love, what kind of amazing love is it that God would, would, would obligate his son to something like this for the benefit of others? Therefore he had to be, he was obligated to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Nothing new. Christ has gone through the suffering. He learned obedience through it. And we're going through it, but we're not going through with the full weight that Christ went through, and we're not doing it alone. We're doing it with Christ, and we're doing it with one another. Which is why it's a gift. Because we're growing to be more like Christ, and we're growing in unity with one another when we suffer. Look also at Romans 5. Romans 5, 3-5. And there's so many places in Scripture... I think we tend to pass over. Or we only look at when we're in some kind of health crisis or some kind of trial. But do we actually look at what is the context of a lot of these sufferings? It's being bold and living for Christ. It's loving Him so much, I don't care what happens to me. And people hate you for it. And not only this, but we also, verse 3, exult in our tribulations. Exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. So we're not saying suffering is good because suffering is the end, and we just love suffering. It's not sadistic. It's saying suffering is good because it makes us more like Christ. He brings us through to make us more like Christ. This isn't like some kind of Mother Teresa where I'm going to cause these people to suffer so that they might earn their way to heaven, which is what she did. That's not what he's talking about here. When you love someone, when you love someone, you long to serve them, don't you? Have you ever been incapacitated in any way and people have just served you, and you feel so helpless. And you're like, you know, I wish I could just do something for them. I really wish I could just do something for them. Not to pay them back, but just to show them how much I appreciate them. Have you ever, have you ever been there before? And Christ is so gracious. That's what He's given us. Because we love Him so much. What do we give to the King who has everything? And he says, oh, I've made a way. And guess what? It's also for your benefit. Suffering. 
suffering. Here's our opportunity. Suffer for Christ's sake. Let's go back to Philippians 2. Philippians 1. And he says in verse 30, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Are you experiencing that? This is the measurement. Measure yourself. Are you being given the gift to suffer for Christ? When you talk to people about your testimony, maybe people you're going to hang out with on Tuesday night, you say, God has been so gracious to grant me this suffering that I might know Him more, that I might love Him more, that I might have more of an affection for His people and long to be with them in heaven, worshiping Him and praising Him. What are the idols, the things that we have in there? We're really good at that, aren't we? Creating idols and justifying ourselves. There's so many ways. And I think for a lot of us, our family becomes an idol. Our time becomes an idol. Any good thing can become an idol. I want to ask you this. Who knows John Bunyan? John Bunyan had a whole host of kids. One of them was blind. He got arrested for preaching the gospel. And you know what they said to him? If you promise not to preach the gospel, you can leave. What would you have done? Well, I got all these kids. My daughter's blind. I have to, I have to be able to go and I have to work for them. I have to provide for them. If I'm not doing that, then I'm, I'm worse than an unbeliever. You see how easily we can justify things. He said, if you let me out of here, I'm preaching the gospel. And he stayed in prison. Because as much as he loved his family and as broken as he was over that, he would not make them an idol. He would not put them above Christ. So as I say that, what aspects of your flesh are rising up within you, even right now, to justify, to argue, to find some way to not allow the Word to permeate into your heart and change your life? Are you sitting right now in your heart making excuses and justifications and defenses? How are you justifying the laziness and treason against Christ that arises in your own heart or that you exhibit from your life? Maybe it's not in that area, maybe it's in another. You know what they're all going to give rise to? Disunity. Because when you can stand in judgment over Christ and His Word and say, this I will follow, but this I don't like, you're no longer worshiping God, you're worshiping yourself. And it's so subtle. And we do it so often. Which is why we continually need to keep our hearts in check and need to be fellowshipping with one another. It's interesting, so many of us say, I need, I need to be in the Word all the time, in the Word all the time, in the Word all the time. And there's nothing bad with being in the Word. It's good to be in the Word. But oftentimes we need to be around more people who are in the Word. Because your blind spots are still going to be your blind spots. And as you read through this passage, you're going to read through this passage the same way you did last month, the same way you did the month before. But when you have another person that loves you and is committed to unity to come alongside you, they're going to be able to say, I don't think you should be doing that. I don't think that means what you think it means. Let me help you. Let's discuss this. And that's when we grow. The people of God were fellowshipping every day together. When the church first started, there was so much unity. But we have compartmentalized so many things. And so we will not experience the same conflict with Paul. 
not that we see in him in the word, not that we hear about in the word, and we will not experience the same conflict that other brothers and sisters across the world are, are experiencing. We've seen the mandate. We've seen the manner. We've seen the measurement. We've been weighed and been found wanting. Now let's look at the mindset. Look at chapter 2 with me, if you would. Therefore, on the basis of what was just said, see, verse 27 is a hard break in the letter. This therefore, he's reaching back and saying, this is the main pillar in which I'm standing on. 27 to 30. If there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, here's a command, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Doesn't that just scream unity? Unity in Christ with one another. Having the same mind, same love, united in spirit. What happens when you have the same mind? There's not a whole lot of conflict that rises up. And even when you have disagreements, we have the same mind. We've got the same goals. Let's lovingly discuss this. We're not going to say, yeah, well, agree to disagree. We're going to say, well, one of us is right and one of us is wrong, brother. So why don't we take some time and let's dig down and see, or maybe we're both wrong. Let's pray and let's work through this. How often do you hear that in a conversation? No. You see it your way, I see it mine. Agree to disagree. That's it. Really? Tim mentioned the high priestly prayer. I pray that, that they may be one even as we are one. Is that what happens in the Trinity? Well, Father, you see it your way, I see it mine. Spirit, new. No. We'll just all agree to disagree. What blasphemy is that? And Christ prayed for this. That we would have this union, this unity. And we're so quick just to say, agree, disagree, no. That we would have more conversations where we would say, yeah, well, we don't agree on this. So let's do something about it. Let's pray. Let's dig in together. Maybe let's grab somebody else to bring them in too to help. Same mind, same love. Not just a love for myself, it's a love for Christ and a love for you. And a love for you. Where my goal is to love Christ and to love you. To spend and be spent for Christ and to spend and be spent for you so that on that day I have nothing left. So I have nothing left. It's all gone. I've spent it all. Maybe I die because I spent it all. But I'm committed to love. I'm committed to unity. Verse 3, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Selfish ambition. Didn't we hear that when we read through the Scripture? Selfishness means it's the same word, selfish ambition. Did we hear that when we did our prayer? These people rising up and preaching Christ out of selfish ambition? Seeking to make a name for themselves? It's not that they were preaching a false gospel. Paul doesn't shy away when somebody's preaching a false gospel. But their motive behind it was wrong. And he said in that, hey, they're going to do that Christ is being proclaimed. But this, with you, no. You're not to do things out of selfish ambition. Why? Because the ambition that we're supposed to have is that in pursuit of Christ and loving Him 
and then in loving Him and loving His people. And when we're seeking our own, it's really hard for me to love you if I'm focused on my time, what I'm going to get. If I meet with you, you come and you're struggling with something that's really serious to you in your life. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I've only gotten four hours sleep for the past five nights. So, and then I walk in to meet with you thinking, I hope this isn't going to take too long because I'd really like to get some sleep. Would you say that I loved you when I did that? But isn't sleep a good thing? Isn't sleep important? Especially if you haven't had it in a long time. Do you see where we can go with these things? But rather to say, my job, my responsibility as a Christian, and even more so as a pastor, is to love you. And so I know that in the fulfilling of my responsibility and bringing about unity and presenting you complete in Christ, God will supply the strength that I need and give me the wisdom to be able to help you. And I don't have any different spirit than you do. We all have the same spirit. We can all do this. We can all love one another and not do things from selfish ambition or empty conceit, vain glory. We've talked about this before. Vain glory, empty. You know, you go out on a cold morning, you go, and you see that. And it's gone. That's the word vanity. It's empty. It's fleeting. There's nothing to it. This word is the word glory with vanity in the front of it. Empty glory. Isn't that true, though? We like to think we're somebody when we're not. Vain glory. Like with the situation I just used. Who's to say that my sleep is more important than the counsel or the help or the love that this person needs who's coming to me? Does God say that? Or am I putting myself before that person? I'm putting myself before that person. That's vain glory. And we do this in so many ways. We have no glory, but we seek to assert ourselves. And we place stumbling blocks before people, don't we? I know the Bible says this, and Jesus' yoke is easy and His burden is light. But, I'm going to throw this on there, and this on there, and this on there. And how often do we sever fellowship ties with other Christians because they don't meet our requirements? This unity doesn't end at these walls. This unity is for the church universal. But it should be especially present in this church. But that doesn't mean to the extent where it's not present with other churches and other believers. If Christ can fellowship with that person, who are we to say, I won't? Do you know what you've done when you've said that? You've disowned Christ. Doesn't mean serious conversations don't need to happen. Doesn't mean you ignore things. But the unity must be preserved. It must be pursued to the point of suffering, to the point of death. How much was suffering, how much was unity important in the early church when that Ananias and Sapphira came in and lied for vain glory? What happened to them? Were they paraded around with pomp and circumstance? God made a very serious statement, and we have it recorded because it's still in the text of Scripture, and He still feels the same way about it. Struck them dead. That's not saying that He's going to strike all of us dead. He may, He may not. But what's that saying? This is His opinion of vain glory. This is His opinion of unity within the body. But with humility of mind, there's a mind again, humility of mind, lowliness of mind, regarding one another as more important than yourselves. And then verse 4, do not, literally it would read, do not look out for your own personal interests, but for the interests of others. 
I like how we tend to hold on to that merely that's there in italics because it's not really in the original. Do not merely look out for your own personal, but also for the interests of others. No, that's not what it says. It's saying don't look out for your own interests. Look out for the interests of others. When Jesus came to earth, how did he live? A king in a castle? Having servants waiting upon him? Did he come to be served? No. But to what? Serve. He stayed up late into the night, working, healing people, teaching. And then he would get up early, three, four in the morning, to go be alone and pray. To the point where he would pass out from exhaustion. Because he was on mission to serve God and to serve others. And if we call ourselves Christians, followers of Christ, disciples of Christ, how do our lives line up to that? When we say, Father, I love you with the same fervor and love that your son does, and I love your people with the same fervor and love that your son does. And it's evidenced by the way I spend myself for them. And then he says this, the mindset, have this attitude, command, in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, the model, Christ Jesus, who although he existed, and again, that's not, that's not a good translation, although he was existing, although existing, it's present, not was, although existing in the form of God, he didn't stop being God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to, to be held on to, but he emptied himself, he made himself of no repute. How did he do that? By taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we've gone over this before in our discipleship. What is it here that's happening? Is God the Son being changed or losing some attribute? No, he's not. He's still has his attributes. He's using them. He cannot not have them. He always has them. What is God doing right now? The answer is is always the same. Simultaneously exercising all of his attributes. That's what he's doing right now. That's what he does. And he does not change. He cannot change. And so what happened here? That glory, that form, that form is the outward appearance, like metamorphosis when it was changed, the form was changed on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was veiled. It was veiled with flesh. So what was that manifestation of his attributes? His glory. Do you see the contrast here now when you recognize that this word that's here, empty conceit in verse 3, literally means vain glory. You see what Paul's doing? Do nothing from vain, empty glory. Here's the one that actually had glory. He could have done what he wanted. What did he do? He did what he wanted. What did he want to do? To serve others. Humble himself. What if I'm right? What if I actually have glory in this? So does he. How did he use it? To serve others placing others before himself. He doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything. But too often we get caught up in pursuing our vain glory. We see Luke 9.23, we have to take up our cross. So ask yourself, when you're, we're coming to these situations, when there's a disagreement among you, how do you handle it? Do you have categories of importance? Like, there are some things, I'll be honest, I will say this is a hill to die on. If somebody attacks the Word of God, attacks Scripture from within our church, the inerrancy, sufficiency, authority of Scripture, that's a hill to die on for me. And if there's unity that's going to be broken, it's because there wasn't any unity to begin with. That's different than somebody does something and hurts me in a certain way, slanders me, gossips about me or something. Is that a hill for me to die on? Do I have to hold that against that person? You have, to, you have to ask yourself, what are these categories? What are my hills to die on? 
What are the things when I have to say, no, this, this is it. I'm going to die on this hill. Because if you don't have that clearly delineated, two things is going to happen. The one, you're just going to get walked all over and become bitter. Or you're going to be argumentative because every hill's a hill to die on. But that's not putting others before yourself. When you have certain hills to die on, it's because it's rooted in gentleness, which is rooted in what is said about God, about Christ, about His Spirit, about His Word. So that when something comes against it, you'll be able to say, I love you and I'm preserving unity. And because of that, I need to say this hard truth to you. Do you see the difference there? Is every hill a hill to die on? Am I bringing glory to Christ or am I bringing glory to myself? You've probably heard about the two Moravian uh, missionaries. They found out there's a whole bunch of slaves on this island, sugar plantation. They wanted to go and preach the gospel to these slaves. There was one problem. Nobody was allowed on the island except for the owner and slaves. So you know what they did? They sold themselves into slavery to reach these people. And as they were standing at the boat as it was leaving their dock in Europe and their families are there crying and their friends are crying and their church is crying and it starts pulling off, one of them shouts out. What do you think he shouted out? Shall not the Lamb have the full reward for His suffering? Shall not the Lamb have the full reward for His suffering? And they sold themselves into slavery and preached the Gospel because there was no other way. This was their commitment to unity in Christ. This was their commitment to unity in God's people. Even in God's people they'd never met before but hoping in the promises of God and trusting in the promises of God and seeking to preserve unity among His people and to allow the Lamb to have the full reward for His suffering. They committed, I will struggle, I will strive arm in arm with you unto death for Christ and for His people. Loved ones, will we not do the same? A couple hours from now, you'll be at home or wherever thinking about talking about whatever. But will you be making plans to preserve unity in the bond of peace? Will you be making plans to make sure that we are living as citizens of the gospel, that we're having this attitude of Christ, the one with true glory, that did not assert it to build us up, to build you up, to build me up? And would we then go out in the name of Christ with no glory of our own and tear someone else down or not strive to lift them up? May that never be said about any one of us here. Having heard the truth, having known the truth, may His Spirit seal it to our hearts that we would not sin against it. Father, We praise You and we thank You for the grace that You've shown us in Christ, Lord. That we would be a people marked by love for Your Son, love for You, love for Your people, love for one another, love for the lost. That we would not seek to assert ourselves, but to serve. Knowing where we have come from, from the depths of hell which would with which You bought us and brought us. How can we have any boasting? How can we seek to hold to any glory? Let us glory alone in Christ as we seek to love Him and His people with all of our hearts. It's in His name we pray. Amen.